him and several of his family, and they're they're warring families in this region between the cops and the, the Muslim Arabs. They find the guy that killed his father. They ambush him. They hack him to death to like cut out his heart and then eat it. <laughs> in one version of the story, they find the jar next to a skeleton laid on a bed of like charcoal and the skeleton has elongated teeth, uh, legs and fingers. So Nagamati is off the chain, man. Um, so early accounts of Nagamati were coming in through the French scholar Duress. And he could he 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 visited there in the fifties, did some interviews, couldn't really get a good sense of when these things were found, and uh, kind of got told they were found uh, not in Nagamati, right, but about five kilometers to the north on the big on the big. Uh, uh, the if you if you think about the Nile kind of wrapping around, see the mountains to the right of the oh, Nile. Okay, over, yep. over here. Okay. Yep. So see those cliffs right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those cliffs running along that, there's a road right there running along the, the Nile. Yeah. Those cliffs right there, those are going to be somewhere roughly where Nagamati was found. Basically, think about think about Nagamati and just go five kilometers north, and that's basically where you hit those cliffs. So that's this where you, general area right here. Yeah, that's the that's the big, uh, the big right. mountain where uh, in all those cliff face there, there's a bunch of pharaonic tombs. So, well, so what do we know? We know that um, there's a dude named Muhammad Ali, not that Muhammad Ali, but Muhammad Ali, uh, and some people, the number of which ranges from two to a dozen. They were some, they were out sometime in December, probably of 1945. They found themselves in a rock enclosure, not exactly clear what that rock enclosure was. And in the process of doing something, yeah, that's that, that's a really great. Yeah, you can see some of the some of the uh, the the caves and stuff in the region. They found um, somewhere. It's still never been completely identified where they found a jar. Now, what's interesting is that the top of the jar survives. Probably, I can send you a link to the a picture of the top of the jar which is weird because not fo many folks know about the fact that the top of the jar probably survives. Um, the rest of the jar has never been found. Um, so it's a jar. It was sealed with bitumen. And Muhammad Ali is at first wondering whether or not it has like spirits in it. <laughs> and then he thinks, what, what's a common belief at the time? There's gems right. in them. And then he's like, well, there may be gems in it, but there also may be treasure in it. And so what does he do? He breaks it. He, he busts it open, probably because it was sealed at the top. The jar has some bitumen that sealed it shut. Mm -hmm. So that's the top. That's the only part of the jar we've ever found um, that's, ever been, that's ever been recovered. What ends up happening, right, is they shatter the jar. Muhammad Ali says, basically, we can divvy up the manuscripts, depending on how, what story gets accounted for. Uh, there are 12 Although some accounts have 13, but really, again, the 13th is just some uh, fragments uh, of a text, and then they're basically stuffed into the six codex. But what makes the story completely like Looney Tunes, and I'll get back to the rest of it later, yeah. is the way that Muhammad Ali remembers when he found it. So the way he remembers it is that it was a period of time after someone had killed his father and someone had killed his father and that set off a blood feud. Right. So yeah. if you kill my father, well, I got to kill you. It's gangster stuff. Right. 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 So depending on the what version of the story you read him and several of his family and their, their warring families in this region between the cops and the, the Muslim Arabs, they find the guy that killed his father. They ambush him. They hack him to death to like cut out his heart and then eat it. <laughs> this is the beginning of the story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like the way he remembers when he discovered 
Nagamati was it was like a few months after they hacked the dude up, cut out his heart, and then ate it. Wow. That so can't was, be, that can't be hello. Hello? I I don't have no idea. <laughs> Who knows? People so, are people. People do things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it's like you even get these weird accounts in like the recent uh uh Syria war of people eating people's hearts. It's like maybe it's a, 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 a sort of a hardcore blood revenge thing. Maybe. Um, now this feud, by the way, impeded the the search for where the Nagamati Library was eventually found, because according to Muhammad Ali, they were out searching for uh, sabah, which is a kind of uh, a fertilizer that's that's found in the region, and that they were searching for fertilizer and then found the jar. Now, part of the problem with this whole story was is that Muhammad Ali eventually was arrested, you know, for killing this guy and eating his heart and stuff, um, and they had to like eventually come back in like the 70s and they found him and they had to try to find all the people that were part of the discovery or part of not discovery who knows but he would only go to the area where the nagamari library was discovered basically they bribed him and protected him so they had to like dress him like a soldier because the blood feud was still going on like when they hacked the dude up in his heart that caused another attack on the other side of the family and that eventually caused another attack where they were burying that guy and they showed up with a bunch of automatic weapons and like mowed down people. Wow. So like this, these families have were like in an intense blood feud in the midst of this discovery, which in their family is like a weird footnote. <laughs> right. But for world history is like the, you know, one of the biggest, biggest manuscript discoveries ever made. So they have to like sneak him across the Nile and like hide him as if he's a soldier and then he points out a couple of places where he found it, like that cave and that cave. And then they excavate it. They find nothing. Um, and he's totally unreliable as about where exactly he found it. They're like, he was, I was in that cave or I was cave 72. And then I was in that cave and they never completely ever found um, where Nagamati was discovered. Really? Like, so when he says they they broke the they broke the 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 uh, he took a mattock and broke the the jar, and he said he saw like dust fly into the air, which may have been papyrus fragments, unfortunately. Wow. Um, he offered to divvy it up among all the people that were there, basically so like we we could all share the treasure. There's some story that happens. There's some stories where that didn't happen. Um, what ends up happening is these texts get brought back. Now, one persistent myth that gets repeated constantly is that some fragments of the Nagamati were burned uh, as part of like making a fire to cook bread. There's actually no evidence that happened. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't think so. Yeah. I mean, even back then, everyone knew that ancient papyri was worth a bunch of money. Right. Um, everybody, even pretty, you know, pretty remote farmers and stuff or whatever. Um, so they, so there's a persistent idea that it was burnt, part of it was burned to, to cook bread that there's good evidence that that didn't happen. Um, after that, it's a complete nightmare of intrigue because basically what they try to do is they try to sell these manuscripts to anyone that will buy them and no one wants to buy them. They're offering them up for like a Egyptian pound. Which is, which now is worth very little money, but it was not nothing back then. And they try to sell it to all kinds of people. Eventually, they try to sell it to the cops, right? The the cop copts, uh, the Egyptian Christians. The cops kind of recognize, especially a school teacher recognizes what these are, right? And it takes a while for them to trickle up to the antiquities market, right? And by then, what ends up happening is. Uh, they kind of get bought by one antiquities dealer. One of them gets smuggled out. Uh, Codex one gets smuggled out of Egypt, ends up in Basel. It's actually meant to be a birthday present for Carl Jung. No way. No. Oh, yeah. Like it, like they smuggle it out and they want to give it to Carl Jung for his birthday. <laughs> because Carl Jung was like one of the people who revived Nazism. He was all about Nazism. Yeah. Right? It's, that's why Codex one is still called the Jung Codex. 
Oh, uh, I always wonder why it was called that. Yeah, it's been repatriated, right? But it, it it was like smuggled out, and it took forever for it to get back to to uh, to Egypt. But the long story short is, it enters the antiquities market. There is a nightmare of how they're handled, and eventually, what ends up happening is all the manuscripts are seized by the government and nationalized. They're declared they're basically declared national treasures. They end up at the Coptic Museum where they are today, and eventually, the Jung Codex also makes its way back. There are a couple fragments in the Yale Banky Library and a couple fragments here and there that are still not returned, but eventually all of them make their way back to to the Coptic Museum in, in Cairo. Wow. But it is like if you actually like read the Robinson two volume like sixteen hundred page uh, story of every single transaction, like half of a Egyptian pound for this. They take this book and tear it in half and get this. You you would be shocked that any of it survived intact. And you also begin to realize why it's like why you get texts like Zostrianos that are just in fragments. Right. Because papyrus in Egypt does really well, but papyrus changing hands, getting banged around, getting wrapped up in a turban. Right, like getting like shipped back and forth, going to Switzerland. These texts just don't survive. They're very fragile, and um, yeah, it, I mean, it's amazing they survived to the degree to which we have them at all. So that's sort of the general outline, right? Like Nagamandi is sort of crazy, and I'm sure that the Askew Codex and the Bruce Codex, which are also probably crazy stories too, we just don't know. About about how we just but the general thinking is they were found in a tomb uh but we don't know uh and there again that's not unique right the the uh, chester Beatty papyri were found probably in tombs there have been other papyri found in the like the basement of a house uh why nagamati was found where it was found right like was it because of like the pacomian monastery nearby but they like buried it there. Was it buried with someone? There was a monastery nearby, a very prominent monastery. So like a Coptic monastery? Yeah, it was a Coptic monastery there in antiquity that for which we have literature from Pacomius. Like he wrote stuff at the time that Nagamati would have been probably buried. Wow. Yeah, and I think so, there's something there. I think that, that makes sense. That makes some sense, but like there's no evidence from the in the Pacomian monastery only survives in ruins. But there's no evidence that it's pretty far away. Like it's far enough away that it probably wasn't found there. But other texts have been found in monastery basements, basically. So was this the case that there was sort of a... And also what we know is that the Episcopate structure, the, the top-down, hardcore, heavy, uh, bishoporic structure that we think of the Catholic Church, it was actually pretty late in, in Egypt. Um, and not only was it late, but it was um, not as rigorously applied as it was in other places. And so an, an, an edict going out to say you have to destroy books or whatever, when Nagamati was buried, and we have a good sense of when Nagamati was buried, the, in the cartonage of one of the manuscripts, we have some dates, which is really convenient. Because uh, that tells us that it, it, you know, it could have been buried before then, <laughs> right? Uh, right? So we have, we have dates in some of the texts. And you know, assuming they are all buried together, which is good reason to believe that's true. Um, do you know what? Do you know what the earliest texts on these on these are by any chance? On uh, the in the Cartonage, three forty eight. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Let me check. That would be that would that that's like right when you have this sort of rise of a church, right? Like in Ish, the middle. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah. Let me, see, let me see what the cartonage is. I always forget the exact dates of the cartonage. And then you you also got to factor in. It's not until like the late fourth century Theodosius is when the re, when they really start to make the church a thing, a real thing. Right. So even if it's in the mid fourth century, you can still there's still a lot of this different types of groups of Christianities, variety of Christianities spread out across egypt syria whatever oh right and and uh and yeah and not just that right but like it, the egyptian bishoporic system was never 
it, it we have a good sense of when it became very powerful and it was relatively late compared to the roman system you know uh and, and again like also nagamati didn't really exist in like it was chenobuskeia which was a greek colony that was there on um and yeah again uh, and again also how how heterogeneous how homogeneous is nagamati you know yeah. one of the things you when you really when you look at nagamati we're not looking at a this is not a Gnostic sex library. This is a pretty heterogeneous group of texts. Um, there are Sethian texts. There are Valentinian texts. There are polemical texts that polemicize against Valentinian Gnosticism and Simonian Gnosticism. Uh, in Nagamati, there are Hermetic texts. Right. Right. Yes. There's a chunk of Plato in there for some reason. Um, I would, I'd rather think about Nagamati at, again, as a library um, of texts that ultimately, for whatever reason, got bundled together. But even the even the the manuscripts themselves aren't homogeneous. Again, like I said earlier, there's a range of quality of them. Some of them are written very well. Some of them are written very beautifully. Some of them are written very badly. Some of them are produced using really high quality papyri papyrus some of them are used poor quality papyrus some of the leather leather covers are tooled and quite nice some of them are just thrown together some of them have reinforced bindings to like protect them which is a sign of like there's more care for that one some of them don't wow um, it just makes the whole thing mysterious yeah it just it just shows us that that what we have in the nagamai library it's not, it's, it's not like we have like, here's my Gnostic church's books, right? We don't, that's not what we have. It's, it's as if we have a chunk of something else. And now what's weird about the Nagamai library is that we do see evidence that some scribes, there are two principal scribes in the Nagamai library, it seems like. They've copied a wide range of things, of which only, I think, two things overlap. Maybe the Gospel of... It's not the Gospel of Truth, but maybe it is. Um, but very little overlaps between the, the scribes. We have, then we have several other scribes working on the texts. And generally speaking, no two scribes, with, I think one exception, worked on duplications. But we have several duplications. Right, there are several duplications in, in the text, um, and also what's weird about Nagamati is that while all of it is generally Sahidic um, in terms of dialect, there's even internal differences there, which tell us that the translations made that made the translations from Greek that made it into the library were made by people who didn't even speak the same dialect of Greek that it, or of Coptic that eventually was copied into the library. So it, I, it's, it's much more miscellaneous than people think. Yeah. Because the translation just erases all that. Yeah, you're right. You you read it in English and you just think it all flows it, that way. It's all the same thing. Yeah. But no, like, it, it's important to know that who wrote what, um, like, even the quality of the books, like, it's interesting, like, Nagamati one has one major choir. A choir is just a bunch of texts that are, uh, a, so codices are made of choirs. So think about a bunch of papers that you fold together and then you bind that, bind that, uh, that fold of, of, of paper, of papyri. Codex one is just, is actually one choir and then a couple other choirs, tiny choirs put together with it. Every other one is just one choir. Wow, uh, which is typically a sign of bad book binding. You, you uh, in good books, you want to have a lot of little choirs, not one big choir, because what ends happening is that the book bulges at the front. Um, you and you, you said there's not a lot of copies of these texts. There's like just like one of each. Is that what you said? Or typically, there... yeah. I mean, we do have some. We have do have some duplications. Um, in fact, Codex thirteen is a duplication. Um, that's why it's. I think well, Codex thirteen as much as the Codex it's actually just one. Uh, it, almost, text. it almost makes you wonder if this is like a wealthy collector. 
That's one theory. One theory is that what we have is a, a, a wealthy monastic person who yeah. just collected a bunch of this stuff and could just order sub monks to copy it. And uh, it was buried with him. I'm not, I'm kind of partial to that actually. Sure. Um, and the reason why I'm partial to that is uh, we just have lots of other cases of books being buried with people. And if this collection was for a relatively wealthy, maybe untouchable monastic person who couldn't get easily written off and the hammer was coming down at the time and they happened to die at the time, um, that's a convenient reason to bury the books with them. Yeah, that makes um, sense. But also, oh, I didn't mention this either. One of the other completely crazy alien thing about Nagamai Library is that in one version of the story, they find the jar next to a skeleton laid on a bed of like charcoal. And the skeleton has elongated teeth, uh, legs, and fingers. Get the F out of here. <laughs> How do I not know? I've never heard this before. Yeah. So in one version of the story, I think by Muhammad Ali, uh, the skeleton that they found near the body was like weird looking. <laughs> like weird, long, long teeth, long teeth and like long, long fingers. I don't know, dude. It sounds super weird. But I remember like reading this stuff. I, was, like, I remember, I think it was an undergraduate because we in my in my undergraduate library we had the entire Nagamai library and the whole thing. We had all these things, and I would just sit in my library until the library closed, reading all this stuff. I remember just pouring over these books, and I'm like, and and the and like Robinson just notes this in passing right. that the book that one version of the story was that it was found near a a, a corpse uh, with unusually long teeth and fingers or something like. Interesting. Wow. And they never found this body, obviously. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot to there's a lot of information that based on what you're saying, you can make a lot of hypotheses off of. Like, was it a wealthy collector? Was it a group of scribes that were ditching it all? Right. Or or a monastery that had it and had to get rid yeah. of it. Right. Exactly. Which I think is also a really viable hypothesis. Yeah. Um, but it's still but a mystery. It's still a mystery. We don't even know where it was found. Like, like we talk about cave four, cave 11, like there's still good. We still have a good idea of Dead Sea Scrolls. Nagamati. Are people I'm still over there looking for stuff? To I'm this sure. Day? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure that every there, I, I don't imagine there is a single Egyptian peasant with a day off. Yeah. Not in a cave looking for something. Cause again, it's a lottery, man. That'd like, be a fun hobby. If you lived over there, uh, it'd be a fun hobby. But you know, I, I, yeah, I think it, I think that you, if you found something, you're in like Dan Brown territory quick. Um, you know, the only the only thing worse than not finding something is finding something, because I think that you're probably going to get into your head because I'm sure that like you how gangstered up that stuff is, I you know. Imagine. Yeah, I mean, and again, especially when you read when you, when you read the news about Hobby Lobby, you're like, oh yeah, what is going on behind the scenes in the oh. world of. In the world of artifacts. Oh, yeah. I mean, with ISIS and stuff, too. And again, we also consider, like, I mean, ISIS is an operative on the Nile Delta, but in the Sinai, ISIS controls still chunks of the Sinai. Right. I don't know why they don't talk about that, but that's still a thing. Um, um, but I'm sure that uh, there are guys out there in the middle of the night digging up graves, trying well, to find something. Because it's a Indiana. way out. There's some Indiana mm -hmm. Jones type character out there right now. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there are, there are 150 of them digging right now. I'm surprised they don't make an Indiana Jones film about the Nagamati scene. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Is like the 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 Nagamati Library, like it is with the, like the blood feud and uh, you know these things changing hands and it going to Jung and. Yeah, because the the, the uh, Spielberg always ties it with the Germans and the Nazis. Yeah, yeah. He can like throw Carl Jung as a character in there, and like the Nazis are chasing Carl Jung and something. He, it could easily be a yeah. it could easily be a, a a movie, and why it's not is it blows my mind. Yeah. But I think most people think like Nagamai got discovered in 1945 and it got published. <laughs> that is not the way it happened. Like it got discovered in 45, and it was on the antiquities market. 
and it changed hands between, you know, every codice, every codex was in someone's hand at some point. Um, but, you know, and it, it's it was everybody trying to make a buck. And again, that's not surprising. Jesse Scrolls were advertised in the New York Times for sale. Like, you know, um, and people thought they were fake and, you know, uh, people thought all this stuff. But if you get a copy of the Nagamari Library, be thankful. Yeah. Like, that could have all ended up, you know. Gone. Gone, destroyed, in private hands, never should have lied a day. Uh, I think the Egyptian government made the absolute, absolutely right decision to nationalize the whole thing. Like they recognize, I think they recognize it as a national treasure. They're like, "Yep, it's ours." <laughs> Sorry, like we'll give you something for it, but this is a national treasure. Like we're we're taking it. Yeah, I think that's well within their right to do. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not like the U.S. wouldn't do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I think you you should compensate <laughs> the people. You know, you know, like the British have the Treasure Act that if you discover if you discover treasure or something and the british government declares it treasure and seizes it they have to pay you market value for it nice it's it's a good way of stopping you know thieves. And, that, and that way it ends up in a museum somewhere where it gets taken care of and exactly. preserved so you, the public yeah. can see it and all that right. stuff right it's the uh yeah the indiana jones principle it, it needs to be in a museum right um it needs to be in the hand of scholars now just because it's in the hand of scholars doesn't mean it's in good hands by the way the dead sea scrolls are, are proof of that i mean yeah. the, the guy the early guys that that bow guarded the dead sea scrolls and prevented anything from getting out and anything in translate even they couldn't do it themselves and robert eisman was a, was a big part of them releasing that there's a story yeah. that. oh it was a mess it was yeah. a total mess the church was involved the catholic church was involved it was a total it was a, it was a dumpster fire yeah um but no, I think it's a. I think this is a place where UNESCO needs to be more uh, ready to act. I think that UNESCO needs to be. Um, so UNESCO is like the UN organization that declares things human treasures, basically. And once a thing is declared a UNESCO treasure, you can't do anything with it. I think UNESCO needs to have agents on the ground in Egypt and Iraq and other places. And when things are found of significance. Uh, UNESCO needs to be willing to offer top dollar to secure them um, and then facilitate the process of competitive bids by universities, public bids to do the work of translating it. Um, and I think that's important too, because this is our history we're talking about. No, it's, so share, it's human history. Yeah. It's just something we should be prioritizing as much as our future. Like, no, I think, I think if we can dump a billion dollars into a video game, You're right? Which we do all the time. Do all the time. Uh, we need to dump billions of dollars because, because at the end of the day, if we can't compete with big tycoons who can just take these things off the market, which is a thing that's real, um, human history is deprived of them. Human culture is deprived of them, yeah. and in my mind, uh, that's a real tragedy for us all uh, because I don't want these things to become investment items in jp morgan's bank account right you know or or a, or a cool thing to show to your saudi friends or whatever or right. sitting on oded galan's toilet you know i don't want any of that um these things need to leave the private market they need to be put into into public institutions um even if they're still technically owned by people yeah it's like the dead sea scrolls has their own like museum where you can go in and look at it and right the trying of the book yeah. Uh, although I will, I will say, uh, Neil, when you when you go there in October, just uh, be read real carefully because a lot of the stuff in the in the uh, shrine of the book is is replicas. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. That that, that uh, it's Kip Davis told me that too. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's a lot of replicas. The, the Isaiah Scrolls a replica. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, I'm sure they keep that stuff buried a mile beneath ground. That's true. Case. That's true. Uh, but yeah, it's um, whichever. I'm fine with that. But yeah. yeah uh, uh, as long as the replicas look good, and like yeah, they look good. They look good, and there are some authentic ones there and things like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, these things. People, poor people, Egyptian peasants, right? Egyptian people who are poor, they need to have the encouragement to go to the authorities, like UNESCO, and then know they will be paid handsomely by UNESCO. And then we can trust UNESCO that will make these documents available to us. 
you know, there needs to be there needs to be a, a chain of command for this yeah. to happen correctly, because you know we don't we can't even read chunks of the Gospel of Judas because these jackasses put it in the in a freezer in Ohio. Yeah, to make a buck, you're in the middle of the text. It just drops off, and then you yeah. got you have to like guess what it's. Oh yeah, you can see like in the Gospel and Judas, the, the entire center of the of the codex is just destroyed. Yeah, I'm like. And I don't know if that's exactly because they put it in a a freezer in Ohio. It didn't help. Right. Yeah. Right. And so like, we just need to have like these, these people in these developing countries need to know, then go to UNESCO and they will be paid handsomely for these documents because they, they deserve whatever, like give them money. Right. Like let them, let it be the lottery. (laughs) Create an incentive to, for people to actually bring these forth and right. Create the UNESCO lottery. Yeah. Uh, so when they find it, they win the lottery. Fine. They get their families out of there and they make a million dollars. I don't know, whatever it is. But um, it's better that than they go to some unscrupulous antiquity healer who destroys these things. 